Turn with me to Luke chapter 2. We're going to be reading verses 8 through 10 in Luke chapter 2. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you, and he is the Messiah, the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for that baby born and lying in a manger. We thank you, Lord God, that you chose to reveal him to us. And Father, while we were yet sinners, God, you chose to demonstrate your love for us that for you so loved us that you sent your only Son, that whosoever puts their faith in him should never perish. We thank you for that blessed hope that we have. And Father, we once again pray this morning that God, you're glorified through everything that's said and done here. In Jesus' name, amen. In Exodus chapter 33, verse 20, God's speaking to Moses, and God says to Moses, You cannot see my face. For no one can see me and live. No man's ever seen God's face. They've seen the physical face of Jesus, but not Jesus necessarily glorified. But what happened is, is that the closest thing in the Bible we get to be in the actual presence of God and live is what's called the Shekinah glory. The Shekinah glory is a visible manifestation of God on earth. And it's presence is portrayed through a natural occurrence. Many times it's accompanied with angels or clouds, almost like a smoke. The word Shekinah is a Hebrew meaning and it means dwelling or one who dwells. Shekinah glory means he calls to dwell, referring to the presence of God. It is not simply with the presence of angels. Angels appear throughout the Old and New Testament. They appeared to Samson's mom and dad and said that they would have a son who would begin to deliver the Israelites from the hands of the Philistines. Angels appeared to John the Baptist's mom and dad and told them that they would have a son. He also, angels also appeared to Mary and to Joseph and to the women at the tomb. But yet the Shekinah glory doesn't seem to be there. Shekinah glory happens though throughout the Bible. It happened with Moses who saw a bush burning one day. And Moses' response to the Shekinah glory, the presence of God there, was to take off his shoes and hide his face. The Bible says because he was afraid. In Isaiah, we find that Isaiah saw the Shekinah glory of God when he was in the temple one day. Isaiah's response was, Woe to me! I am ruined! For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. It happened in the New Testament with Peter, James, and John on a mountaintop with Jesus when suddenly Jesus was glorified. And Peter actually spoke to Jesus while he was there with Elijah and Moses. And he said, let's build, a, let's build three tabernacles here and let's never go down from this mountain. But suddenly the Shekinah glory appeared on that mountainside and a voice began to speak. And when that voice began to speak in Matthew 17, 6, the disciples' response was this. They fell face down to the ground, terrified. Paul on the road to Damascus. One day he saw his blinding light and he was ushered into the presence of God, the Shekinah glory. The Bible says he fell to the ground. In other words, as soon as this happened, he hit his knees. John. On the Isle of Patmos, in the book of Revelation, he was brought into the presence of the Lord. And the Bible says that when John saw the Lord and was in the presence of the Lord, he was unable to move. He was unable to function. The Bible says he fell at his feet as if he were dead. The Shekinah glory experience. I hear so many people talk to me about what they're going to say to God one day when they get into heaven. When they stand before God, I have a feeling that their mouths will become numb, don't you? that they won't be able to speak in the actual presence of the creator of all things, the creator of the universe, where they say you can take a rocket ship and shoot up, traveling the speed of light, and you would never reach the end of the universe. 
Such a majestic, almighty God. What's a little man going to say in the face of God? We may think we're tough now. We may think we're strong now. We th may think we're courageous now. But wait until we're in the presence of the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the almighty creator of the universe. And all of the examples I gave you, these were basically religious people. And they experienced the Shekinah glory of God. But in this case, here's another example of the Shekinah glory of God appearing to some shepherds keeping watch over their flocks by night. These men were different. They were not religious men. They were not people who went to the temple. They were not people who went to the synagogue. They were not people who had the scriptures memorized and read to them. Probably they were illiterate, unable to read. And yet as they were watching over the flock that night, suddenly angels appeared. But that wasn't the Shekinah glory. Then it says the presence of God surrounded them. And at that moment, they became terrified in the presence of God. Because in the presence of God, suddenly we see our sinfulness. We see our humanity. We see our inabilities. We see our inadequacy. But the question I want to ask you today is why? Why did God choose to reveal himself to these shepherds. See, basically in this time, there were two types of people, pretty much like it is today, that were living in that world, especially around Jerusalem. There were, first of all, the religious people. They were morally upstanding. They would be what the world called good people. They went to the synagogue. They went to the temple. At least they hid their badness well. It was very easy to be religious in those days, 2,000 years ago, and it probably seemed like most people were. You see, politics and religion were pretty much the same. There was no separation of church and state then. As a matter of fact, a politician was a religious leader. If you wanted to rise up the political ranks, you became more religious. You became a chief priest. You became more religious. The government was made up of religious leaders who, were forced, who enforced religious laws. Whenever you read the Bible and you hear about lawyers coming to test Jesus, what these lawyers were were scribes. In the day of no printing presses, you would actually have to handwrite the Old Testament. And so these scribes would write the Old Testament and make new manuscripts. And when they would write these Old Testament uh, manuscripts, they became so familiar with the Old Testament that many of these lawyers had the Old Testament completely memorized. They knew it by memory. They could quote you chapter and verse of all the Old Testament. Could you imagine? They had written it so many times. So they knew the laws, they knew the traditions, they, they knew all the regulations of Judaism. And so when it talks about these lawyers, that's who it's talking about. These were people who knew what the law of God was. And what happened was, is the people of Israel, the chief priests in the Sanhedrin, they would try to enforce these laws. And if it hadn't been for Rome, basically overruling them many times and not allowing them capital punishment, I'm sure many more people would have been stoned because of their sin or been punished very uh, severely because of their sin. The culture was very religious-centered. What happened was you had the temple in Jerusalem where they made the sacrifices yearly. And outside in all the communities and little towns around, there were synagogues where people went and had the Old Testament read to them at this time. So much of the culture centered around religion. Also, there were those, of course, that were not religious or irreligious. There were the hooligans, the ruffians, the ragamuffins. We know that. We see them also mentioned in the Bible. There were drunks. There were addicts back then. There were outcasts. There were thieves, swindlers, prostitutes, and johns. They were the worldly, they were outlaws, they were forbidden even to enter the temple because they're obvious and open sin. They had issues, as we would say. And it was in this kind of group, the irreligious group, that the shepherds fell. They were neither religious nor ritualistic. They didn't have time to be. There was no time for organized religion. They were always with the sheep, the stinking, smelling, dirty Sheep, working with animal products, unkept, unclean, basically homeless, hard men living a hard life, eating with their dirty hands, thumbing their nose at the ritualistic cleaning demanded by the religious, sleeping outdoors, seldom bathing. They were stinky and smelly. They were not even allowed in the temple many times. 
You see, it was the religious that looked for the Messiah. It was them who searched out the scripture and read the scripture about his coming, and they had it all figured out. They had looked at the signs, they thought, and they had believed, come to believe that the Messiah was going to come soon, and he was going to come as an earthly warrior, as a warrior king, that he was going to come as a priestly king like David, and he would gather around his army, and he would begin to deliver Israel from the hands of the Roman Empire, and he would establish Jerusalem as the capital of the world, and his reign would last forever. And so they anticipated, and they waited, watching for his priestly coming. But it's not the religious. It's not the chief priests. It's not the rabbis that God appeared to to announce the birth of Jesus. Who was it? It was these irreligious shepherds, these non-ritualistic shepherds. Do you ever wonder why? Why would God reveal himself to them? Wouldn't it be a whole lot easier for God to just reveal himself to the Sanhedrin, those who had been anticipating his coming? But no, he revealed himself to ordinary men doing an ordinary job. Maybe it's because religion had shut the door on them. And by doing so, they had shut out God. And so God decided he was going to kick the door open. Let's get real. Most churches aren't really churches today, are they? Not really. They're not an assembly of believers gathered together in Jesus' name to bear one another's burdens and to know God and to help others know him. Instead, most people view church as a building where they gather. And whenever they come, they think they're doing God a big favor and that God should bless them for their presence for being there. They go because they're either brought up to go or because they feel like they should bring their kids up the way their mother and father brought them up. So many people go out of tradition which unfortunately a tradition that is quickly ending because some of the kids have dropped out of the, out of the tradition through the years because they've seen the hypocrisy inside the church and they see no relevance in the church. And so the churches throughout our community, even here, are closing their doors. I went to a, drove by a church just the other day, a church building, and there was a sign out front that said, For rent! Church is closed! For rent! You see, the ones who do come, many times come looking for something to get, looking for a quick fix, looking for an answer to the problem, looking for the entertainment, sort of come in and prop back on your plush pew, hold your eyes open and say, all right, preacher, keep me awake. After all, I'm going to give you a quarter when this thing's all over. But what I find is that real Christians, true Christians, and that's who Jesus came for, Jesus came for those who were real Jesus came for those who were ordinary. Jesus came for the common man. And he announced his birth first to the common man. And I found that Jesus came mainly for people with issues. You see, what I've discovered is this, that I find real Christians, true Christians, who make up the true and real church are usually people who have been through a lot of pain. You see, life's not easy for them, is it? They've been scarred, sometimes nearly fatally in life. Either they've been scarred physically or emotionally or spiritually. And because of these scars, they've many times scarred others, others that they claim to love. They've been driven by their selfish, narcissistic tendencies until they finally came to the end of themselves and surrendered themselves to God because God was the only place else left to go. And God appeared first to these shepherds. Because God so loved the ordinary man, and God so loves you. And the reason we read this scripture this morning, and the reason it's recorded in the book of Luke, is because Luke wanted you to know, as God wanted you to know, that God for so, so loved you. He so loved you. No matter what you've done, no matter where you've been. Is it any wonder, when Jesus physically walked on the earth, that those who followed him were ex-drunkards and prostitutes and adulterers and outcasts, while the religious people of that day persecuted him. They wanted to kill him. They chased him from the synagogues and from the temple. Chief priests and those who knew the law of Moses constantly questioned him and looked to trap him in order to kill him. And when it came time, they, the religious people of that day, voted to crucify him. For in appearing first to the religious outcast, God made a statement. And that statement is this. No matter how religious you think you are, or how irreligious you are, you are all, we are all sinners. Sinners who need saved. And Jesus said, my mission is this. 
I came into this world to seek and to save that which was lost. That's the heart of Christ. That's all that Jesus was about. And you cannot be saved until you realize you're lost. You cannot and will not go to a doctor until you realize that you are sick. And as long as you think you're good people, as long as you don't think you need God, as long as you think you can do it on your own, then God's not going to appear in your life. Isn't that true? I mean, how many of us, even today, we'll try everything before we'll go to a real doctor, won't we? And the same is true spiritually. We'll make all kinds of promises. We will commit ourselves to so many causes. But the truth is, we're not good people. We're all sick and in need of a doctor. When Jesus appeared to these shepherds, there's a message of hope. The angels said to this, it said, Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. Born to who? Who did the angels say that Jesus was born to, the Messiah was born to? Born to these shepherds. Born to these shepherds. Do you realize who you are? Do you realize what God Almighty is doing here? He is loving you even when you're unlovable. This will be the sign, the angels say. The sign will be this. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, is how the King James says, lying in a manger. Now I want you to notice something. The sign was not the presence of God. The sign was not the Shekinah glory. The sign was not the angels appearing. The sign that a Messiah had been born for the ordinary man was not a thousand angels singing. The sign was simply this. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a feeding trough. Let me ask you a question. What is it you're waiting on? What is it that you're looking for God to do before you surrender to him? Are you waiting for some blinding light? Are you waiting for angels to be singing? Are you waiting for the presence of God to appear? Because I have a feeling the next time we're ushered into the Shekinah glory of God, it will be when God judges the quick and the dead, when all people stand before him in his presence. But God has shown a sign to you. Now maybe that sign has not come in a way you wanted or expected. Maybe that sign to you that God loves you came in a mother still praying for you. Maybe it came through the birth of a healthy baby boy or girl. Maybe God's sign to you that he loves you is that he's brought you through these times that you barely escaped death or serious injury. Or maybe God's sign that he loves you comes through a pastor speaking the word of God to you. Maybe it comes for, from some lives that you have seen changed. Maybe it comes from an act of kindness that someone gave to you. But God gives us a sign. Many times it's not the blinding lights, but it's there. If we'll just take a moment to look around, to pause, and to see what God's doing. My friend, God loves you. The Bible says that God demonstrated his own love for us that while we were yet sinners, Jesus went to the cross and died for you. And I say this so often, but you know, we like to think we're good people. I hear that all the time. I mean, somebody say, Brother Wade, you're a good man. I mean, like, whoa, you don't know me, do you? You only know what I project. You only know what you see. I'm not a good man. Man, I struggle. I struggle bad. I struggle with a lot of things I've been struggling with for 30 years. God knows my struggle. You see, there's a difference between struggling and quitting, though, isn't it? There's a difference between falling down and staying down and stumbling and getting back up. All of us stumble. All of us stumble. All of us hit the ground sometime. But you know what makes you a child of God? Is that you get back up and you move on. And you understand that the grace of God and the forgiveness of God is a safety net for you that's always there. Because you know what? The Bible tells me that no man can pluck you out of the Father's hand. And that includes you. If you are a true child of God today, Jesus went to that cross while you were yet a sinner. He saw you at your most hideous state. You remember that state? For some of us, we remember that most hideous state very well, don't we? It's when we were caught doing something. 
or when we were exposed or when those blue lights were flashing in the driveway and mama saw us being handcuffed and put into the back of a police car. Some of us know those humiliating moments, those situations where our sin was made known and exposed. And at that moment, God was there. Maybe even in your hidden sin that nobody knows about, that's not yet exposed, that's not yet discovered, God knows what you did. And at that moment, Jesus went to the cross and died in your place. And if you're the only person to ever come to Christ, he would have went to that cross and would have died for you. The question to both the religious and the non-religious is this. It is not, does God love you? It is not, is God still reaching out to you? The real question I want to ask you this morning is, do you recognize that he is? Take a moment this Christmas and get alone with God. And just let God love you. And as you get along with God and let God love you, just reflect for a moment. Maybe look at your children. Maybe look at your aging mother or father. Just take a moment to pause and just think for a moment how good God's been and how awesome God is. This will be a sign unto you. Not my presence. You'll just find a baby in a feeding trough. And that baby represents, for God so loved the world, for God so loved you, that he gave his only son, that whosoever trusts in him will never die, but have everlasting life. Let's go, Lord, in prayer.